so that whole mix was magic so then you know if if i could bring some psychological safety where people could contribute to their maximum potential it was just uh, it, it, i i did not think of it when i was building it but in retrospect i think that, that, that that's what the team of 18 was equivalent to a team of 80 because of uh, that glue Welcome everyone. Today, I will be talking with Chandri Madas. She is a tech entrepreneur and product builder with over 20 years global experience in wealth management and the banking industry across several major financial areas. She founded Bento, B2B2C Wealth Tech, which was acquired by Grab and rebranded as Grab Invest, a core business vertical under the Grab Financial Group which Chandrima led. Prior to settling up Bento, Chandrima was managing director in the Bank of Singapore, and prior to that, she was CEO of ING Investment Management in Singapore. Come join us as we chat about her super inspiring story and what makes high performance teams. Chandrima, it's such a pleasure to have you here. Welcome. Thank you so much, Rodrigo. It's my pleasure to spend this time with you, given the good work that, that you're doing on a topic that is very close to my heart. Oh, that's so nice. Good. So let's get to know um, Chandrima. Can you tell us a bit about your journey? You know, I have about 25 years in uh, wealth management, financial services, and technology. So I have worked with uh, asset managers. I have worked with in banks. And, and also, I set up my own startup. What, what I know best is how people do and how they should manage the, their money and the technology around it. So that's a bit of long and short uh, about what I do. I've been very lucky and I have worked in some of the biggest financial centers in the world. I started my life working in, in Bombay and then I worked in London, a bit in Hong Kong and then many years in Singapore. Wow, what a journey. I, I never believed this could have happened. <laughs> <laughs> Good. And so, and I mean, your last venture, so you, you launched your startup, um, a fintech uh, business, and uh, it was a successful business that you end up uh, selling to, to Grab. Can you tell us about that journey? Every entrepreneur or many have this amazing story about how they came out with the idea. But I have to disappoint you, I have none of that. Um, <laughs> So I took a break from work to sort out some personal stuff in 2015, and I realized that technology in personal wealth management was getting very, very big. And if you went to New York or if you went to London, there were billboards, there were like signs in, in the tube. And um, so I opened accounts in, in some of those, and I started to read about, and I realized it is relevant. It met a certain need for investors. And Asia being about five to seven years behind the US, uh, there was some game in that space. And I knew that domain. So also if you look at, if you talk to 10 people, nine of them would tell you they're not happy with, the, with, with, with their banks or with their financial advisors. And I would say 10 of them would tell you they don't know what to do. So with that purpose, I set up Bento. It was a wealth management for uh, individuals, but at some point I realized that you know, getting individuals on board is very hard and it's very expensive. So we did a little change, keeping the same purpose in mind, to work with banks and with brokers to help them provide uh, lower cost and better services for personal wealth management for individuals. So that's the long and short of the Bento journey. So in, in that journey, what were the two things that you consider, I mean, you did a lot, but what are the two things that you, you did that contributed to the success of Bento? You know, there are four or five things an entrepreneur does. One is to set the vision. And, and the vision has to have relevance in a, for a long period of time. And the second thing is, which is a topic, as I mentioned, very close to my heart, is assembling a team. And the third thing that you have to do is uh, raising money or you bootstrap it 
And the fourth thing, of course, is to path to profitability, going to market, and, and mainly client acquisition. So these are the four or five things, and in each one of them, you know, an entrepreneur has many inflection points, decision to be made, and you, you basically live by the sword. Mm. So, and, so you had many challenges. What was your main challenge that you faced in that journey? There are many, many challenges. <laughs> and uh, human memory is fickle. So we always remember the good parts. We forget the bad parts. And I, and I always joke that if we remember the hard bits, then most people would not have more than one child. Huh? Most entrepreneur would not ever say that I want to be a serial entrepreneur, yeah, isn't it? Mm -hmm. So um, I think the main challenge is as the people that you want to work for or work with, you cannot afford them. You want to work with this individual, the mindset matches, and uh, you, you, you know that there is a fix, that there's a fit, but I mean, they have other priorities in life and you can't work with them. So assembling of the team is crucial. So what we end up seeing is in many uh, startups, there are clones of each other. So we went to the same university, we stayed in the same dorm, we worked in the same company for 15 years, and uh, th 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 those are options. But assembling a team that can take an organization forward is the biggest challenge. The second one is, um, is funding. So there are many different types of funding. You can do angel investors, you can go to VCs, you can go to the corporate VCs. And, but what is the mix that helps you propel forward? So I think these two were the biggest decision-making points and, and, and the things that I, that I grappled with. And, and for you, so before you come, you were working for in the corporate world for many years. Uh, and I would like to, to ask, what, what was the difference between your perception of what it was to be a, an entrepreneur and the reality when you were in the, as an entrepreneur? The, the, the delta is massive. <laughs> so, and I talk to a lot of like-minded entrepreneurs. Everybody jumps in thinking, you know, I'll be my own boss and I'll have control over my time, and anything that I build would be lapped up by, by uh, you know, whoever I'm building it for. None of them happen. So, so the first thing that I lost as an entrepreneur is control over my time. It is, it is you're switched on 24 seven, and the, the second thing is you are your boss, but in reality, the consumer for whom you're building it, you have to build something that has, that has purpose and consumer delight. So you're not the boss. The boss is the buyer. So, but as you asked, what is the difference between an employee and an entrepreneur? An employee takes some decision, but may not have to justify them. Whereas as an entrepreneur, you end up taking many and most decision and you live by them. And uh, nine out of 10 startups fail. So mostly it is the entrepreneur who pays, he or she can lose the shirt off their back. So it's a different ball game. And the decision making, the kind of how much you are vested in it, and it, it is just 10 times a high octane. But if you see, if you type entrepreneur, you know, I always look at where the biases are and where uh, where the imagery is, and if you type entrepreneur in, in Google, and if you look for images, you see the, the footsie table, and then you see bean bags, and you see people lying down reclining. So in reality, people sit in, you know, your you sit with your colleagues and your teams in reasonably cramped conditions. It's, it's tight. Uh, you, you, I, I have taken $100 flights, and I have lived in hotels in Bangkok for $50 a night. As an employee, I would say even an analyst when you start up, you don't do that. So it is the pressure on taking the right decision. It is cost control. It is 24-7. Uh, These are the three main differences uh, with, uh, with corporate world. There are no ping pong tables. Those are, those are imageries that are not real at all. <laughs> and uh, so you spoke about bias. 
And uh, I mean, you worked in an um, industry which is normally um, more male uh, dominated. And how you, as a woman, um, navigated in that world in order to succeed? Yeah, I, I grew up in a very small industrial town in, in Rajasthan, which is, uh, it's a wrong word to use, but it's a backward state. Mm -hmm. And so I have, since, since very young, I have been on tables and in rooms where there are mostly male. So it, it never struck to me that I'm in an area where it is male dominated because th th that was uh, the, the way of life all, all along. But, but what happens is there are biases in everything. You, you type leadership and a certain kind of images come up. Then you type software developers, there are Asian male of a certain age. So I think what we are fed also, it, it, it pushes our, our biases, it ingrains them yes. even more. So in that, if you talk about software, if you talk about you know, financial services, there are not many. But there are not many women. Mm -hmm. And also, there is a lot of ageism in uh, in the financial service, uh, in, in in the fintech or the technology space. If you type tech founder, uh, the Patagonia jackets, and and a certain image, it it comes up. But you know, that is the reality on ground. You and I can work together not to propagate those biases, but we can't solve the problem. And. Uh, the, the, the purpose of, when, when, I, when I set up Bento, it was not to um, solve for biases or not, not, not to solve for a representation of, of a certain gender, but it was a different purpose. So I kept my eyes on the ball, and if it was easy for, uh, you know, it, it was easy for my clients, it was more palatable mm -hmm. for a competent colleague of, of, of mine. Say, for example, our sales was done by, a, now he's a very good friend, by, by, by somebody called Martin, whom I greatly value, and he was better perceived than me, then so be it. <laughs> and uh, so I, I did not fight it because that was not my agenda. And, uh, but I, I just uh, worked towards the purpose of the organization. Wow. I, I love that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So being an entrepreneur, it's like an adventure. It's like ups and downs. Uh, what did you enjoy the most as, as an entrepreneur? You know, as an as a employee, yeah. there have been days when I woke up and I've asked myself, oh, wh wh why am I doing this? Do I need, really need to peel myself out of you know, my chair or my sofa or my bed? And I, and I, I, I don't want to go to work. And that, that happens to a lot. But when you are in the driving seat, yeah. there is no option. And it's a choice, it's a pleasure to wake up and just keep going on. So there is no plan B. Mm -hmm. And either you make it or you shut shop. So it is not that I can, you know, it, it's not that I can make a CV. Yeah. And I think that, that was the best part of it. But as you mentioned, the highs and the lows are highly accentuated. So the, you, you have, and you have the highs and the lows in the same day. You have, oh my goodness, today I have got a demo with, with this bank. And then there is somebody, some VC that I wrote to, has written to me saying, he does, doesn't even want to talk to me. Yeah. And the person whom I wanted to recruit said, yes, I want to join, but hasn't turned up to work today. <laughs> so the same day can have yeah. massive peaks and troughs, which in a, in a corporate, it is not so, it is quite attenuated. Yeah. And it happens over time. It ha doesn't happen in the same day. Mm. So it's the whole, I think it's, a, it's like a sport, you know. It's the adrenaline that you get on a, on a, on a daily basis mm -hmm. that drives most. And, and th that creates the serial entrepreneurs as well. I'm, I was having goosebumps over your answer. I just loved it. <laughs> yeah. So now, so now there's so many ups and downs. What did you find that worked really well for you in terms of um, um, managing your emotions while going up and down? Actually, I'm, it's the wrong answer, but I'm not very emotional to start with. Okay. <laughs> so, and, and you know, if you have a purpose, if the okay. team is aligned to the purpose, 
then uh, yeah, there are extreme highs and extreme lows, yeah. but uh, just plow through, just get on with the program. Yeah. <laughs> so good. Okay, so you, you said that two of the most important things that you did, so one of them was to assemble the, the, the team. How did you um, assemble, um, let's say, a high performance team to help you succeed in your startup? You know, I, I just can't uh, stop saying this, but the people whom you really want to work with, you can't afford. But what ties humans together is a sense of purpose yeah. and is values. So during my journey, one thing that I learned, and I don't want to unlearn that, is the, the power of connectivity connectivity with, with other humans. And uh, I, I did not do that often when, when I was in, in, in my corporate role. I would deliberate a lot about why does this person want to meet me? Why would I want to meet this individual? But that I had to throw out of the window. And, and there was this individual who advised me, you don't choose whom you meet. If somebody gives you time, you go and meet them because you don't know what comes out of it. And I hold that close to my heart. So um, my, my team was, one person, she was uh, the head of product and whom I have known for many, many years because she was so deep in domain. And she quit a job from a very well-paying bank and I think came at a salary that was a third of what the bank was paying. But I think it was a sense of purpose. It was the vision where we were aligned. Then, um, the, then the COO who also did sales, he also came from a bank and then he worked for a startup. But what got him onto the journey is again the vision. So I think setting a vision that resonates with, uh, with, with the team that you want to work with, but also the long-term or medium-term or maybe short-term prospect of making some serious money, which is important because we all are commercially driven. Yeah. You know, we all have bills to pay. Huh? And uh, so the commercial purpose, the ability to make money, and the vision, and the delight that we can bring to a consumer segment I think that is the glue of the team. Then another thing that we did is we had no hierarchies. And that, that meant that everybody sits on the same desk and everybody travels the same class, the same ticket, the same hotel. And uh, we, we, we would eat out. We used to go to Lopasa actually, which, is, uh, uh, we, we, which we still yeah. go back quite often and have satay and, and beer. Once in a while. So I think it was the microcosm of a classless society with psychological safety where every voice mattered and with, with the purpose of vision which, which helped drive the glue of the team together. Wow, there's so much value there. So also in, in that, so you bring many different people together. What is the role of let's say, cognitive diversity also in, that, in the success of building a team? Well, like diversity has many dimensions. Yeah. And uh, if you read the papers or, or if you see what's going on, it, it, we are unfortunately focusing a lot on the um, visible part of diversity, yeah. which is we look at geographic diversity and we look at gender diversity. But what really matters when you are developing a product or you're building something from scratch is, as you mentioned, cognitive diversity and the other part is micro diversity. Mm -hmm. So, you know, does every woman who, who, who grew up in India think similar as me? Maybe not, because I grew up in an environment of scarcity. Mm -hmm. I grew up in an environment where opportunities were just not there. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, but am I different from a male who is Indian, Indian male or a South Asian or a brown person who is, who is quite driven and aggressive, internally maybe not. Mm. So optically I may seem to be different, but my functioning may be the same. Yeah. So whereas if you look at microdiversity, microdiversity is most of our developers were of a certain age group. They, they were men, I could mm -hmm. not, uh, I tried my best, but they, they were all male developers, but they were very different because they had different backgrounds, educational backgrounds, different, and we often don't focus on upbringing, yeah. but our, the way we 
do decision making, our work ethics, and the way we treat people around have a lot to do with our upbringing. We, we don't focus, we, we, we don't think about that. So the upbringing, we we're just very different. So because I did not gravitate towards uh, my just having a group of ex-colleagues or ex-university mates, we ended up, not out of intention, but the outcome was this mix of a, of, of a very diverse group. So we had uh, people who, different background, cognitively operated differently, and uh, in terms of microdiversity, mm -hmm. they may be the same age group, but the backgrounds were so different. You know, generalization is not correct. But I will just generalize a bit, and I will, uh, um, I will extrapolate that. So my head of product, she was in Singapore. She was, she's a Singaporean. And her eye to detail, given the way the education system was, was outstanding. So in the product, we also had somebody from China whose ability to look forward and be quite brave mm -hmm. was there. Then we had engineers from India, we had a Burmese engineer, we had a North Korean engineer, and then we had, we had some from India. So that whole mix was magic. So then, you know, if, if I could bring some psychological safety where people could contribute to their maximum potential, it was just, uh, it, it, I, I did not think of it when I was building it, but in retrospect, I think that, that, that that's what, the team of 18 was equivalent to a team of 80 because of uh, that glue. Wow, so much diversity in that team. But when you bring so, so many different people, when there's so much diversity, how you as a leader then can manage all that in a way that aligns towards a purpose? You know, I think we humans are curious. And more curious of us end up uh, in places where new categories are being built. So we were literally curious about each other. Like say for example, you know, you grew up in China and you were the second or third child or whatever. H how, how did that happen? And uh, so, so someone, she, she was from Burma with us. What's going on in Burma? And, and, and how did you come out of it? How did you end up here? So I think we were just curious about our backgrounds. And, uh, and then if you are free to speak whatever is right with the right purpose, I think uh, th there were only positives and, and huge positives. And, and today there's so much talk going on around diversity. Do you consider, is, what are the misconceptions? That, is there any misconception happening today? And if yes, what are the misconceptions? You know, perception becomes reality. And one of the misconceptions is if I take a picture of my team and everybody looks a bit different, and then there is geographic and gender diversity, it's, it's, it's become like that. And as I mentioned that, you know, you, you, you put me a room, maybe with, with, a, with a couple of, uh, I don't know, with, with a couple of white males, I may be as driven, as aggressive, and, and as whatever. So am I diversity, but not? But optically, if you take a picture of me and you and I together, we look diverse. So I think w w what we are not working on and, and, and we are not spending enough effort, as you said, cognitive diversity, the way decision making is done, and introversion versus extroversion. So we, we form teams with chatty people who are extroverted, who are, who are interesting, but innovation and new ideas and, uh, and, and m most of the things that we use today have come in from deeply introverted people. And that is cognitive diversity. And so we, 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 don't, we, we, are, we are focused a lot on optics yeah. and not on the outcome of microdiversity or cognitive diversity. So I think mm -hmm. these are, and if we go down the path, I have two daughters. Mm -hmm. I, I feel bad because they may end up growing quite entitled. And, um, but what we need to build up upon is how our minds work differently, and that's where the beauty of diversity is. Wow. And so you, you are also, an, uh, well, you're an investor, so you, see, you also get in contact with many startups, many entrepreneurs. 
What do you observe as a, a common uh, mistake that some entrepreneurs they do when it comes to leading teams? So, you know, if you want to build something on domain, yeah. you can have clones of yourself who have deep domain. And, um, but if you're building something, if you're creating a category, yeah. then you need people who have skills that you do not have. Mm. So you can look at what I'm good at. Mm -hmm. I'm good at A, B, and maybe E. How do I plug in with the, with the others? Mm -hmm. So, because we are, we, we want to, we like to work with people whom we like. Mm -hmm. So that, that ends up in teams that are cohesive, mm -hmm. but you know, they, they are very similar yeah. to themselves. So I, I find a, lo a lot of that. Uh, and I find very few teams that are assembled from scratch and built to last. Mm. Uh, but you know, th th there is no right or wrong. What works for one may not work for other. One of the key reasons why uh, startups fail, and I think it's in top three, it may be the second or the third one, is that the first one is they run out of money, and why they run out of money? Because of conflict within co-founders or conflict within founding team members. So if you work with somebody whom you like, mm -hmm. that conflict can be minimized. But if you pair up with a stranger, mm -hmm. then your values have to be really aligned. Yeah. So you know there is no right, right or wrong. And uh, I, I, I would say one thing that entrepreneurs go a lot for is the whole thing about advisors. And I believe that if you have your, your eyes on the ball, and your feet always in the field or the court, wherever you're playing, uh, then you may not need so much of advice. Your heart or the compass in your mind knows what to do. So, uh, so optically, do you need to sign up for advisors? I'm not too sure. Mm. But if you need a very specific advice on something, then just reach out, but not the broad brush can you be my advisor? Because as an entrepreneur, you know what you want. Well, um, Chandra, I don't know what you're going to do for the next two or three hours, but I'm going to keep you here. We're going to keep going on for two <laughs> or three hours. I think we can go on forever. I'm so excited about your journey. There's so much out there. <laughs> so you already um, uh, spoke about how to retain and attract uh, talent, but I think it's such an important topic Today, maybe we can go a bit deeper uh, on that. What do you think is the most important today for an entrepreneur in order to attract and retain the right people, despite the challenges that you already uh, uh, spoke? As I mentioned that, you have massive highs and lows. Yeah. So when you have lows, then uh, a lot of our human nature fallacies take over. Mm -hmm. You know, you can, you can lose it and... Um, and then you can get into a whole thing of blame game. But I think if you control the emotions when you're going through a very low phase, and if you say we try our best, if you, which is the ingredients of building an organization with psychological safety. And if you say that we do our best, we do it for the right purpose and the right intent, we may fail. We may fail, but, but so, so be it. It is not that you fail or I fail, it is always a we. So the purpose of the organization with uh, where an embedded we in everything, if we succeed, we succeed. If we fail, we fail. I think the whole, I, I think we often forget about it and we focus too much on the entrepreneur. But it is about the entrepreneur, but less so. You, you cannot run, it's a relay race. It is, it is a team sport and you cannot go any farther than what your team can do. So, it is, um, it's just keeping everybody on the same plane. It is over communicating on the good stuff and on the bad stuff. And it is not about taking blame or shoving blame. It is about the whole, the, the, the power of we is yeah. what keeps the, the, the team together. Oh, wow. But you know, we, we, we went down a, a couple of times. Huh? I, I was sitting at 2 a.m. at night and typing, what should I write to the investor? <laughs> they, they will be so upset with me. And, uh, but I, I think it is, it's that, that, that kind of lows um, that, that you have to manage.
Mm. And the highs are, are no, no, not about the entrepreneur. It is no, 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 not about uh, you know, yourself. It is about the whole team mm. that pitches in as much as you do. So uh, now, I mean, we are in the middle of a big disruption happening now, a lot of uncertainty for the, for the future. I'm going to push you a little bit. If, if we look at, let's say, 10 years ahead of us, what do you think is like a skill that um, an entrepreneur needs to start developing now that is going to help him in, in 10 years to succeed? It's um, new categories are being created and a consumer behavior is changing on a weekly, daily, monthly basis. You know? And we have more and more access with our phones. We don't go to branches anymore. We can, we can do all our research on our phones. And we don't need to line up for cinema tickets. Mm. Uh, we may choose not to go to restaurants. So every day new categories are coming up. So I think unlearning is very important. And we often get caught up in, oh, I know this domain so well. Oh, I know this. But unlearning what you know while keeping some of the domain expert in, in place is very important. The second thing, because all the new categories are tech-led. So human-computer interaction is, is, is critical. So I'm, I'm doing a little course on human-computer interaction. It is the, the cross-section between data, between a human psychology, and how tech can be built. So I think that I, I would suggest everybody to delve in because that creates adoption, that creates understanding of who your customers are and how to bring a delight for them in what you're building. Super interesting. So now there's, um, so people ask you a lot of questions to, to you. I'm gonna turn it around, I'm gonna ask you, what would be a question that no one ever asked you but you would love to answer. Is there any question? You know, people think that funding came very easily. But I have to tell you, I had to kiss 80 frogs. And, and, I, and I tell the entrepreneurs that it, you, you make a list of the VCs when you're starting up, but just be prepared. You go frog after frog and frog after frog. It is the 81st. And uh, it, is, it is the rejection which when I talk to some of my industry colleagues, they talk about you know, that the rejection on a retrospective basis, we laugh it out, we say there are lessons because we forget. But the day when you get the rejection, it is so hard. But then you have to go to the office, you have got your colleagues and you've got to have your smile as how great we are doing. We are building something, this is our purpose. So there is a duality between what is going on, the fear of failure, the, the fear of rejection that the fear that you, know, you could shut down any time versus the whole, you know, you got to keep the whole thing together and you, and, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's almost like the smiling joker, right? <laughs> yeah, that, that, that facade and that veneer of, uh, of purpose. Mm. It's, you do have a purpose deep inside because it gets rattled every now and then and, and for, the purpose, for, for the sake of the team, for the sake of your own self, and for everything else, you, you just keep that veneer on day after day. That's the hardest. Wow. So now, just to finalize, so now what's next for you? You know, I'm in Candyland, and um, I'm meeting up with very interesting people. You, you're one of them. And I'm just trying to see, my, my, my purpose, I think, lies in the tech space. Mm -hmm. And, and I believe in, in financial inclusion. Financial inclusion doesn't mean the fishermen somewhere in Philippines or in Kerala. Financial inclusion means you, means me, because most of us don't know what to do with our money. Most of us, you know, just, uh, you know, we, we read and we cobble together something. So how that can be brought together with technology, how that can be gamified, how, how do we teach our children about money? How, how do we you know, push them away from instant gratification? I think these are the several things that are going on in my mind. But really, I don't know. I'm, I'm just meeting people and very interesting people where, who are helping form where I potentially could be next. Wow, what a nice place to be and I also know. opening. I can't complain now. <laughs> Maybe I'll complain in a year's time, but not yet. <laughs> <laughs> so good. So that's it. So we are at the end of our talk. I could continue here at least for a couple of hours. It's, Absolutely. It's been such a pleasure. It's 
to be honest, it's such an inspiration. Your journey is an inspiration. And you shared so many good value. You know, I learned so much. And it was such a pleasure to have you here. But you know, Rodrigo, the pleasure is mine. Yeah, because for you. someone like you who are putting this whole together, that is my inspiration yeah. as well. Oh, that is so nice.